recording. Okay, Andy, we're recording. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, good afternoon on a nice warm afternoon. Um, I'm calling the Finance Committee meeting of uh, July 19, 2022 to order at um, 3 p.m. And uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, which has been extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and legislation that further extends these provisions until March 31, 2023, this meeting is being conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish access have been able to achieve it by Zoom or by telephone, and uh, no person in attendance or members of the public will be permitted um, physically, but every effort has been made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via these technological mm -hmm. means. So with that, I want to go through um the committee members and confirm that um, they can hear and we can hear them and then i will turn it over to um lynn who will uh call the council to order uh lynn uh quick can you confirm your presence present. okay present. uh bob present matt present Bernie? Has it? Noted that we don't um, have Michelle. Uh, Kathy? Yes, I'm here. And uh, Alicia? Here. Okay, well, thank you. So uh, we've confirmed all members of the committee who we know will be here today. Lynn, uh, do you want to call the council to order? Yes, given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm going to call the council meeting to order. And now I would like to check on the following. Shalini? Present. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? Present. Uh, Anika Lopes? I'll come back to Anika. Mandy Jo Haneke? Present. Okay. Anika, can you hear us? Sure she can. We'll get back to her. Okay. Okay. Um, so the way that we're going to proceed today, this is a single agenda item. Uh, minutes were listed as an additional agenda item, but um, for various reasons, um, they're not. We're not prepared as a committee to take them up today. Uh, there was a large group of uh, minutes, and they require little bit of editing and an opportunity for review. So that leaves us with the most important agenda item, which is to just um, have a presentation from Sean, um, sort of kind of giving the background on the financial um, plan for that was originally in place for the four major building projects and what we knew and didn't know at the time and uh, how it's evolved and what he expects going forward. Um, after his presentation, uh, there will be an opportunity for all members of the um, uh, council and the committee to ask questions of Sean. Um, Paul is also here. If there are questions that should appropriately go to Paul, and uh, we will have an opportunity for public comment, but we're going to wait until after the presentation for public comment uh, and um, some discussion from the committee. But I want to assure members of the public that there will be an opportunity. Um, so with that, um, and, I, and again, I uh, will repeat what I said before, because I we weren't actually um, in the full uh, broadcasting we're live at that point um, the material that sean is presenting is available in the packet for today's meeting and uh, for members of the public who um, want to look at it um, at, at a future time or even during the meeting 
on their own, though Sean's going to be showing it to us now. Um, it is available by going to the council page on the town website, the finance committee section, and under meeting packets for today's meeting. So with that, Sean, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Andy. Um, can everybody see the presentation on the screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll spoil the conclusion and just say that there's not going to be a happy ending. Um, it's not necessarily a, a tragedy, but it's not, there's not going to be a single model um, that we're going to share with you today that says that, you know, checks all the boxes of what we hope to achieve. Um, we'll go over what our goals are in a second, but more or less, we're trying to bring the committee back up to speed with what the model looks like, what's changed, um, and what we're going to be working on as we move forward. So that, um, so we're going to cover a variety of topics. We're going to start with goals. Um, so for today, we want to reintroduce the model, um, uh, update members who've seen it before. For members who are new and haven't seen it, you know, we can answer questions about what it can do and what it can't do, um, and just kind of explain how the whole thing works. Um, we wanted to cover some of the uh, economic conditions that have changed in the past year or more since we shared the first model. Um, we'll share a couple scenarios that we're currently looking at, uh, update some, uh, a partial update on the status of each project, and then share some of the next steps and recommendations as we move forward. Um, and it's sort of a long presentation, so I'll stop every couple of slides and see if, um, if there's questions. So we're going to start with the initial model, which is um, was put together back in February of 2021. Um, you can see the sort of the assumptions that are on the screen. Um, this is really to set a baseline. So when we talk about what's changed, you can you'll see pretty clearly where we were and where we're where we're going. So for the Jones Library, the the cost back then was 15.8 million. It was after it was um, it was either right before or right after it was approved, um, and that number hasn't changed as we go forward. You'll see we're sticking to that 15.8 million dollar figure for the town share of the cost. Uh, at the time, the new school, we were projecting a total project budget of about 80 million and MSBA reimbursement for about half. Um, there's been some major changes to those projections. Um, that was a very early high level estimate before we had a designer on board um, and before really some of the, the construction cost escalation went nuts. Uh, for TPW, we projected a $20 million project and for fire station, a $15 million project. And again, those numbers were really high level estimates before we had designers really get in and, and do a detailed cost estimate for a building. Um, we made some assumptions around end dates and when debt, debt would begin, um, borrowing terms, uh, 20 years for the library, 30 years for the other projects. Some assumptions around interest rates, which at the time were conservative. Um, they're no longer conservative. Um, Back then, interest rates were in the ones and low twos, and um, it was a really ideal time to, to borrow, but uh, that's changed a little bit. We assumed one debt exclusion at that time, and it was for just the school project. And then some of the other assumptions that were built into the model. Um, so how much we set aside of the tax levy for capital is an important concept to understanding how this all works. Um, the tax levy is one of our major revenue sources. It's all the, the property taxes and personal property taxes that we collect. Um, you see it when we do the, the, the budget process each year. The town decided long ago that it wanted a policy to dedicate a certain percentage of that tax levy for capital to make sure that um, the operating budget didn't push out capital. So we said we were gonna set aside a certain percentage each year, dedicate to capital so we don't fall behind on repairs and, and addressing, um, you know, more expensive needs of the town. Um, so our financial policies right now say that we want to set aside about 10% of the levy for capital each year. Um, the model we put together back in uh, 2021, we, when we looked at it all, we said 10% is good, but that 10% didn't really account for trying to do all these building projects at once. It was really just for the regular capital needs that come up during a year. And so we bumped that up to 10.5%. Um, and that directly impacts how, uh, the amount of funds we have available to make debt payments, to do other capital needs in town each year. Uh, another major assumption in the original model was how, uh, how much we wanted to set aside for other capital needs. So how much we wanted to wall off um, from the four projects to make sure that we don't fall behind in other and maintaining our assets in other places of the town. 
Um, and so that model at the time said 3 million was the number. Um, and that was based on looking at our plan and how much was coming up each year for um, cash capital and so on. Um, and so that number we felt was in the right area. Um, it could go up or down a little bit depending on what we wanted to do. And so the result of all these assumptions that we really look at, and you'll see it on the, on the, the newer models that we're looking at, is when we plug all this in, what does the model tell us we would need to pull from reserves in order to make it all work? Um, and the way we calculate that is basically where, where do the costs each year exceed how much funding we have available? Um, and so the output from this model that we presented back in 2021 was that we would need to pull about $4.6 million of reserves over a number of years. So it, it wouldn't all be in one year, but it'd be spread out. We would need to pull that much in order to make this model more or less work on an annual basis. So looking back, I think we would love to have this model back, um, but I think things have changed so drastically since then that, uh, you know, that's, it's in the rear view mirror. Um, so before I go to what's changed, I guess I'll just, I'll pause here and see if there's any questions on the initial model, um, anything that people have had coming into today's meeting that they have a question on. And I can't see hands of, so um, Andy, if you see anybody with their hands up, let me know. I don't see any hands going. Uh, right, there's one. Kathy, Kathy. Has raised her hand. Kathy? Um, uh, hi, Sean. Thank you. Um, just a comment for those to make sure I rem I'm remembering correctly, but for others who haven't seen this, that three million is a per year amount that we were that we were trying to protect and the 4.6 is over this decade period right. is that correct yeah, yeah, so that's, one, yeah that's accurate okay and then the other thing is we knew when we were doing this that this was very tight on operating budget you know so it was we were well we're still coming out of covid um and uh since then we've added a new department on the operating budget so i assume you're gonna as we look forward we were tight before and we're tighter now, I guess is the way the way I would uh, frame it. Although we're recovering better than I think we initially thought we would. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, one of the things we talked about back then was um, once we commit to a plan and we actually lock in, you know, we move forward, we lock in debt, um, that's going to lock things in and there, there will be times when the operating budget and the capital budget maybe bump up against each other. Um, and so how we handle that, um, is gonna be you know, one of the topics that needs to be discussed before we agree to a model, um, before we move forward is, um, are we willing to stick to what we set for capital um, in terms of funding? All right, so I'll keep going. I don't see any other hands. So what has changed? Um, so you don't really have to, I know this is really small, if you, you can zoom in on your um, own version if you have a chance, but um, really it's sort of the shape that's more important with this. So this is around construction costs and the MSBA's reimbursement. Um, so what ends up being the town share um, of the school project. And so what you see on the screen, you'll see a bunch of little dots, which are um, individuals. And this, this all comes from the MSBA's website, it's uh, public information. Um, and what you see on this project are the dots. Those are individual school projects um, at various stages of the, their project. So you can see on the right, the legend, so the orange boxes are um, when the project funding agreements are amended. Um, you've got some bid numbers, um, uh, schematic design numbers, things like that. So um, they're not all actuals, but it just gives you sort of the flow of where they're going. And the in terms of the lines, the one of the most important lines on there is the green one that sort of looks like a staircase stepping up over a number of years. That green line is the MSBA's construction um, cost per square foot limit. So all these, all this is construction cost per square foot. Um, and so when you're above that construction cost per square foot limit, they cap your reimbursement. And so for you know whatever you're above, essentially is all on the town's um, the town's uh, funds. And so back the uh, just. Where we are in right now, actually, I'll start there. Um, this this will change as if we're still sort of at a preliminary stage of the school project. But looking at the last cost estimate we had, our this current school project is about eight hundred dollars per square foot. Um, so we're up near this dot over here. Um, again, that will change a little bit as as design gets uh, worked out further. But um, 
talking with our OPM, we're in that $800 range. And uh, for comparison purposes, the red circle is around the prior elementary school project, um, the Wildwood project. Back then, we were about $450 per square foot. So, you know, with this chart, what I'm trying to convey with this is that construction costs have really accelerated. Um, this is school projects, but I think the shape of this, um, you know, is likely comparable to other industries of construction as well, fire station, DPWs, that construction costs have just really taken off. Um, and that the, the old assumptions around three or 4% cost escalation just haven't been accurate the last few years or really last year and, and going forward. Um, and so why this is important again, is that the more the, your project is above this green line, the more that project is that's gonna be unreimbursable um, where that cost is gonna be completely borne by the town. And so that, you know, we'll have more information on this as our designers and OPMs uh, support us and, and share that information with the building committee. Um, but, you know, it, it's gonna be uh, a much bigger number than where we were before. Any questions on this chart? Okay, uh, Matt. I see that Matt has a question. Sean, I, I may have missed this. Can you just speak to the, um, the average of following construction, the choice of those schools, the comparisons there? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Uh, the, the average, the six schools that we're comparing to, can you just speak to those real quick? Oh, uh, those six, so th that's from the MSBHR. I think that's their starting point. Um, we're not comparing, you're talking about the little box on the left? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's on the that's on the chart. That's nothing that I'm raising for comparison. I think that's basically where the starting point was um, when they started making this um, this table or this chart. But just just current levels. So that would have, that's back in uh, 2010. It looks like when the uh, that information was. Yep. So just to jump in, this is a chart that's taken from the MSBA website. Yeah, Anybody so this is historical, historical construction costs uh, per square foot numbers for different projects over time. Okay, thank you. Bob? Yes, yeah, I just wanted to confirm, it's hard for me to see it, but the current reimbursement maximum is about 360 per square foot, is that correct? Yep, it's in that range. Um, you can see they, in some years, they increase it every, you know, they'll, they'll increase it each year. Um, there was one year where there was a stretch, probably when we were sort of, uh, where prices were maybe going down a little bit or staying really flat where they didn't increase it. Um, you know, I think we're going to be pushing them to do another increase before we lock in our project. Because um, if they do another increase, that, you know, will be that much less above the line. Um, and I think we'll, you know, we've been advocating for a pretty sizable increase. You can see they've done maybe 3% or uh, maybe a little bit more um, in some years, but we would, you know, our position is this should be a pretty large increase given what construction costs are doing. Um, I think their point of view is they've got so many needs and so many projects. And if they, um, the more they reimburse, the fewer projects they can do. Right, okay, thanks. Nothing. Uh, Sean, you may be about to say this, but the other thing that happens when they cap the construction costs, they have a cap on site costs, and it's 8% of construction costs, so you get double hit because they've capped your construction costs, and 8% probably would not have been enough anyway when you need to do, and site means uh, driveways, playgrounds, um, you know, dirt, you know, so it's, it's, it, they're, they're hitting you, they're hitting you twice in the way they're restricting the flow, their share. Yep. Yeah, no, there's been some changes and there's, there's been some changes to the formula just in the past year or so according to our OPM that even further um, reduce what we, you know, compared to what we would have gotten before, what we're anticipated to get now. So um, the MSBA has been, I don't, I don't know what their, their um, objective is, but it hasn't been helpful to the town in terms of our reimbursement. All right, I'll keep going again. This chart is, it's sort of interactive too, so I can send out the link to it if people wanna look at it. Um, you, can, um, you can look at, this is new construction, you can look at renovation addition, you can, you can put some things on there and take some things off, so. Um, so the next thing that's changed significantly is interest rates. So um, this is just a 10 year uh, survey. You can see who provided it um, of averages. Looks at different mortgage uh, 
uh, fixed rate mortgage rates or adjustable rate mortgage rates over the last 10 years. Um, we don't, the, the town doesn't take out a mortgage. We don't follow exactly along with this um, schedule. Our municipal borrowing rates are, are generally lower, um, but we do sort of follow the path or the direction. So if, if interest rates you know, are down, our rates are generally low as well. Um, when interest rates start to go up, these types of rates go up, so do ours. Um, and so you can see where rates are going higher than, you know, we're this like sort of golden age of, of borrowing. Um, for a couple of years, and now we're back sort of higher than the 10-year average. Um, and so, again, it's not, interest rates aren't necessarily bad, you know, depending on your perspective and how long you've, you know, how long your experience is with interest rates, but, you know, they're not great compared to the last 10 years. So, and our current, so what we're, when we, we work with our financial advisor um, to look at interest rates, and we get a, a monthly report of all the uh, borrowings that occur out in the market, municipal borrowings that occur out in the market and tells us how much is being borrowed, what the what their bond rating was, and then what the interest rate was that they received when they um, when you go when we go out to bid uh, for bonds, it's bid out to different banks and lenders. Um, so it's a competitive process and we can see what the rates are that different municipalities are getting. So we're currently in the 4% range um, if we were to go out today for a, you know, a sizable borrowing. Bernie, you're muted still. No, Mike, on yeah, four percent seems high. I mean, the Nash right now, the I don't have any man specific um, info, but right now the national twenty year uh, muni bond is at about two point eight, and uh, thirty year it's about three. So four um, percent is is I think is a bit high. Uh, the other thing so, is uh, gonna... yeah, I can share that. You know, we can share some information, but it, it's you'll. Know, um... You know, it's actual. It's actual information, um, and yeah. it's what our financial advisor is using um, okay. as we project forward. Yeah, well, that's yeah. There's a lot of trust there. So if if he's generating those numbers, and um, you know, we'll we'll certainly uh, use them. The other thing is, is that we're you know, this will be an override situation. This particular project, the school project, mm -hmm. and uh, that should get us a little better rate. Yeah, no, and, and like I said, maybe I can put together, um, or maybe I can just find, you know, so every, there's no fixed amount for the rates, they're, they're competitive, so you'll get some projects where maybe it's a little lower than the average, some that's a little higher, depending on how much uh, interest there is, but um, yeah, I think all the, a lot of the, many of the projects in this past month um, have been in that mid threes to 4% range. Now, they, they may tick back down, so I don't know if you're looking at what your month you're looking at, Bernie, our financial advisor said that there may be a little bit of a tick down for um, a period of time because when they look at the long term uh, rates. But um, the yeah, main point of this is that it's much higher than where we were um, right. a year ago when we were in like the ones and twos. Rates are creeping down, fortunately. So other things that have changed, so operating costs, I think Kathy mentioned this earlier, we've, um, you know, since early 2021, when uh, we presented the initial model, uh, we've created two new departments, we've added uh, four new firefighter EMTs, and we've hit this period of inflation, um, which has put just greater stress on our operating budget and our capital budgets. Um, on the capital side, uh, we've approved the library project, which is a good thing, it actually kind of puts one of the puzzle pieces into place and makes it not a variable. Um, we've approved the ladder truck uh, that wasn't on our capital plan a year ago. Uh, we were hoping to find alternative sources of funding for that for that ladder truck, but the, the timing was such that we, we kind of had to move forward with it. And then the climate action adaptation resiliency plan was approved and we've started to build more sort of ongoing sustainability funds into our capital plan. Um, again, which is sort of a newer capital need in the plan. And then another uh, uh, thing that happened was the approval of the reparation funding plan where we're gonna take about roughly $200,000 per year um, that would have gone into our uh, general reserves and it'll go into a reparation stabilization fund. Um, so it'll just be that much less per year that could have gone towards um, something else, a capital project or other reserve uh, needs. So the next phase is sort of guiding principles, what we're still kind of sticking to as we look at these models. Um, and before we say this is the one we want to move forward with, or we think we, you know, you should consider moving forward with, um, it needs to be affordable. You know, we need to have confidence in the, the revenue sources that they're predictable and that they can be relied upon um, well into the future. 
if it relies on reserves, the, res the amount of reserves need to be something that we feel confident in that we either have it um, or our history shows we will have it very soon. Um, and we need the debt exclusion to cover debt payments for the schools. That's just sort of a, a one of the, the key variables that if it doesn't happen, the whole plan sort of needs to be reconsidered. Um, we want to minimize impact on taxpayers to the greatest extent possible. So that's you know controlling project costs, um, working with our financial advisor to smooth out, smooth out any debt we take on. That's going to be debt excluded. There's ways we can we can structure that debt so that it doesn't hit all at once. Um, and so we got to keep that in mind. Uh, we wanted to complete all these projects expeditiously because a there's you know the buildings all need it, um, and the more we delay projects, they you know they get more expensive. Um, that being said, I think we're going to have to look at the timing of some of these projects and how we how we've been modeling spacing them out um, and determine if it if it works for all of us. Uh, maintain focus on asset maintenance. So uh, this is how much we set aside for other capital needs. Um, that's gotten more expensive just as a result of inflation, uh, especially in the vehicle world, things that used to cost, um, you know, I just heard we have school buses that used to cost about 90 or 95,000. Now they cost 120,000 um, uh, from a bid. So uh, things are getting more expensive. And so the amount we set aside for asset maintenance will need to um, consider going up and then stay flexible. So uh, we want to plan a model, but we also need to be able to step back if things change and, and kind of reevaluate that model. Um, if a year ago we had you know, committed to the model and stuck to it and said, we're not going to deviate from this, we'd probably be in trouble right now, given how much things have changed in the last, um, the last year. So we need the model to be kind of like what it is, which is a guide, um, something we can, we can uh, put the new uh, variables into based on the market um, and make the best decision we can. Some other prerequisites. So again, taxpayer approval of debt exclusion for the school project. That's essential to, to really all four projects uh, moving forward. Funding of capital at 10% of the levy. We've scaled, uh, sort of our thinking is to scale this back a little bit from the 10.5% that we looked at a, um, a year ago, um, partially because of uh, the cost of capital and, and the amount of other capital needs we have. Um, and just trying to be a little bit more conservative on this um, as we see the you know, possibility of entering a recession of some sort in the next few years. Uh, establishing budgets for the project. So, you know, budgets, we, we still have to kind of agree to what those budgets are, but um, we do need budgets so that we can plan around them. And once we do set budgets in place, uh, we need to stick to them um, or have a, a path forward if we make any changes. Uh, use of reserves, we're gonna need reserves to some extent, how much is really um, the big question that we all need to discuss is what do we feel comfortable with? Um, there will be an impact on future operating and capital budgets. Um, if we move forward with all four projects one way or another, it, it, there's gonna be some, um, there's gonna be less funds available for both. Um, and then impact on the debt load of the town. So we've been in this period of time where we've had really low debt, really the last, really since I've been with the town, we've had relatively low debt. Um, and so this will be a change once we take on, you know, start borrowing for these projects, we'll go to a place of having sizable uh, amounts of debt. So any questions before we look at the models, Andy? Yeah, I just wanted to point something out as you were talking about the uh, use of reserves. Uh, we um, always had a policy for many, many years in Amherst of trying to target um, our reserves total, um, including stabilization and free cash of five to 15%. But, um, you know, a number of years ago, probably uh, more than certainly seven or eight years ago, at least, we started a, um, deliberately trying to gradually increase above 15% in order to give ourselves more flexibility and people have been pointing out how high our reserves are, but that was actually a strategic plan that was tied to knowing that we were looking at major building projects down the line. And, uh, you know, we may want to talk about that a little bit more about how they're, why they're needed and how they would be used. But I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I think, you know, one of the things you'll see later on is that we need to continue building, um, reserves for for uh for capital needs specifically um 
and we've got some thoughts about how to maybe make it more transparent to the public. You know, what is what are our reserves for um, sort of rainy day and for our operating budget, and what are our reserves that we're specifically building for capital projects? Um, so that's really clear to the public. Mandy. Yeah. Um with the reserves i peeked ahead so i know some of those numbers but i'm curious what our current reserves are um so the percentage is about 25 percent what's um, that in dollar amount though um I, it's around uh i can get it to you before we leave i think it's around 22 or 23 million some of that range but sonia if she's here she'll know it off the top of her head um yeah i'll get it to you before we leave just so you have that number thanks All right, so um, so we're gonna get into the models. Um, I just wanna again be really clear, we're not saying either of these models are, this is the one we wanna move forward with, this is you know perfect. Um, it's more to kind of say, what does it look like now? What are some of the challenges we're uh, facing as we put in different inputs and what are we bumping up against? Um, and then you know we're gonna keep working at this. But um, so this first model, uh, we've updated um, the estimated costs. So, and I want to stress these are estimated costs, but um, for the library, the 15.8, that one's pretty well uh, set. Um, for the new school, so this is town uh, share for the town only. This is not the total project cost. This is what the town piece would be. Um, we're estimating at 70 million right now. Um, this number could go down if you know we're working with our OPM and our designer to, to estimate as best we can. There's a number of um, decisions that could be made that could get this number down uh, quite a bit, but um, we wanted to err on the at the higher end for now, so we don't have to make a dramatic change later. Um, public works, we've increased this 5 million. It was 20 million last time we modeled um, back in 2021. We've increased this by 5 million. We've increased the fire station by 5 million. Again, just trying to uh, reflect that construction prices have gone way up in the last, the last year. Um, these two projects in particular, and I'll say this again in a little bit, we don't have detailed designs. And so until we get further along a design, which we do have funding for, um, the council didn't approve funding for it. Um, until we get further along a design, these will be really high level cost estimates. Um, the school and the Jones Library, those numbers are getting closer and closer to, to you know, what they'll ultimately be. Um, we've proposed 30 year borrowing terms in this scenario, uh, we, you can see we've increased our interest rate assumptions to be more conservative 4% um, for the library because that one's in the pretty near future 5% um, for the other ones and a debt exclusion for just the schools. Um, this model assumes 10% of the tax levy for capital. Uh, three and a half million per year for other capital needs. We've increased that from the original model, um, again, to reflect inflation that capital uh, has gotten more expensive. Um, and so one other, before I go to the chart, one other thing that we changed from the initial model to this model is the way we are structuring our debt. So I know this gets a little into the weeds, but um, when we did the 2021 modeling, we did a fixed um, principle model of debt, which means your your debt payment starts out high in the early years and then gets lower as you go into the future. Um, and that model of borrowing results in the lowest overall cost um, because you're, you're hidden principal with a lot at the beginning. Um, there's another way you can borrow, which is more like a mortgage where you have a fixed payment for the life of the borrowing. And that lowers your costs in the initial years, but that cost stays the same throughout the life of the borrowing. And that model of borrowing, it costs more, um, but it allow, it, it's also more manageable in the early years um, when you're trying to you know, do four building projects. Um, so you'll see when we look at this, that the debt stays fixed each year for the life of the, um, life of the borrowing. Um, and that's a change from the previous model. And so the result of this is that we would need to use about 13.4 million of reserves over, over the span of time shown here. Um, so for, for those unfamiliar with this chart, the black line models the, the funds that the town has available for capital. The yellow bar are the, um, the amount of money that were set aside for other capital needs in town. So this would be the three and a half million or so that we've selected here. Uh, the green, bar that has the lines through it is our existing debt 
um, running off. And what we've done here is we've also, we've put in an estimate for uh, regional school debt assessments into the future because we know that they've got a lot coming up. And so we didn't want to pretend like that didn't exist. Um, and then the purple bars, the deep, uh, library debt, the gray bars, the DPW debt, and the red bar is the fire department debt. And um, I'll go to questions in one second. Um, you won't see the school on here because it's a debt exclusion. So this looks at our, you know, our existing resources versus the debt payments because the school is being proposed as a debt exclusion that doesn't factor into this chart. Um, and I think I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. We'll start with Matt. Thanks, Andy. Sean, just clarifying, that's a typo. Fire should be um, 23, scenario one. Um, 32 in this, um, that I, maybe I missed. No. So this model, um, we've spaced it out more, um, again, so I'm not saying this is the model we're moving forward with, but this is a model where we said, what does it look like if we space these projects out further? Um, and so this would have the fire department in 2032. Kathy. I, a couple going back and forth, be, people can remember the numbers from the other slide. Um, the 70 million for the school, if we say we don't want to go out for that amount of debt exclusion, when you look at this chart, it says there is no room um, to play, pay out of annual capital funds and reserves if we try to do all four projects is the way I would read this. If if we want to finance a bigger piece of the school from our savings account, I'll just use that, then we would have to make a different decision about fire and DPW. Um, is that, is that a, I'll, I'll ask as a question, is that a correct statement? Because it's not out till 2050 that we're actually under your black line even. Yeah, so I'd say two things. Um, there's, yeah, there's, there's no, I wouldn't say there's room for another building project in this model as it stands right here. Um, I think the other thing I'll just say about this model before we get too far along is that um, I don't like this model. I mean, we're showing, again, we're showing it to you so you understand kind of the variables and how it, you know, what it means. Is this model maybe theoretically possible? Yes. Um, I don't like a model. Uh, my major issue with this option is that planning on having to use reserves in 2032 is really far in the future. And there's so many things that could happen. Um, that I wouldn't feel comfortable with it. So I think this is, a, again, this is sort of a cautionary model of we shouldn't move forward with something that projects needing reserves that far out in the future. Um, the previous model, you know, the, the amount of reserves that we were um, gonna use, it was, it was confined to three or four years and that was in the relative near future um, where we you know, had more certainty about what was available to us. Um, so again, this model, theoretically, you know, could we get to 13 million for reserves over 10 or 15 years, probably? Um, but I wouldn't say this is, you know, what we want to move forward with. Kathy, anything else you have? Uh, Mandy. Um, uh, Matt got to one of my questions, which was the fire station at 2032. What does that mean to the estimated cost of building that fire station like is 20 million then a reasonable number if we're not even debting it until 2032 and then the other question related to that is does the use of other capital for you know ongoing capital include at that point repairs to the current fire station because how is it going to last another 10 years yeah no it's i mean that's we, we've talked about that it's exactly right i think you know fire station 10 years from now um is probably going to cost more. I think you're you're right on with that, um, and that there will be there would need to be some maintenance to that building between now and then um, to to expect it to go another ten years uh, before it starts again. That's why I'm saying this is not the model that we're recommending or moving forward with. But we wanted to show like if you do space a project out and push one farther in the future, you know that's one of the things we're going to have to consider is um, it's just how we how we space these. Lynn? And I want to, besides adding to what Mandy Joe has um, pointed out uh, with regard to the cost of maintaining the existing fire station, I, I'm really increasingly concerned about whether or not the amount that we're putting aside for other capital is sufficient. Uh, and part of the reason I am concerned is the condition of our roads and 
the general overall inflation of other costs related to capital. So while you know we say an amount now, but that amount now in today's dollars is not going to buy what we need to buy in tomorrow's dollars. And I think it's already low to start with. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's, a, again, that's a, the right question to ask is how much do we need uh, for other capital needs in town and, and doing these projects, again, it, it, it's going to take some of those funds away. Um, we do escalate the amount for other capital needs, so it's not a fixed three and a half million that doesn't change into the future. We It's, it's increasing a little bit each year, um, same way the, the funds available for capital are increasing a little bit each year, but um, no, that's what, so one of the things we're looking at is our capital plan going forward. And just three and a half million cover the most essential projects on that list. Um, and I think the road, you know, the road question is one of those ones where we know there's really no limit to what we could put into roads, um, um, given the uh, what we've heard in terms of the the backlog. So um, that's a decision that we'll have to uh, grapple with: is what what is the amount of that we want to put into roads each year, roads and sidewalks each year, um, and then what's left for everything else. All right, so um, next scenario. So this scenario is a little more optimistic. Um, so the costs haven't really changed. Um, in this scenario, we try to do the fire station in FY26, so um, more in the near future. Um, we've shown what it looks like if we keep our interest rates, if interest rates stay around 4% where they currently are. So if they, um, you know, if they if they do go up, if they come back by the time come back down to where they are now, um, by the time we borrow, then that would be great. Uh, again, one debt exclusion for the school. Again, this is a little bit more optimistic. This says, what if we can get to the ten and a half percent for the next five to ten years for capital? Um, really, the next ten years for capital, um, like the the plan a year ago looked at. Um, and what if we can get away with only three million for capital needs, which you know, based on what Lynn just said, I think would be a struggle. But um, this is a big variable. This the amount of money we set aside for other capital needs is has uh, is the variable that probably makes the biggest impact on what we can afford. Um, so you'll see what that means in a second. So the result of this would be um, a model that's much more, again, in terms of what we have to use for reserves, it's much more confined to a few years. Um, we'd only need to pull about 5.7 million out over a number of years, which means we'd have greater flexibility to use those reserves, maybe to reduce other, um, to, to provide more for capital in some years if we needed to for other capital needs if we had to, um, or to do something else with those reserves. But um, this model, again, a little more optimistic, um, but it gets us closer to, to something that we can, uh, in terms of the reserves that we feel comfortable with. Kathy? Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, you know, when we, it feels like more than a year ago, it feels like two or three years ago when we were looking at these, but um, when you go to 10 and a half, it's squeezing operating. And I think we, I, I know you're, you're just trying to right now give us some sense with these big projects, but I think we need to keep flipping over to the operating side, not right now, because um, operating, it, for those for those who didn't look closely at the budget out five years, we're assuming we can get away with two and a half percent increase each year in operating now. you know, so it's a you, you all figure out how to live under two and a half percent. and uh, it's not clear to me that that's possible with what's happening with health insurance and labor costs, um, not to mention supply costs. So, it's a squeeze. I mean, this looks better. So that was just a, a statement about operating the same way Lynn was looking and Mandy were looking interactive with repair costs. So I want to ask how, what percent, what, how much do we need to keep in reserves over the long term to be on the safe side? And, and uh, so uh, do, is it 5%, 8%? So when you said we have 22 million, um, we've built up reserves to pay for anticipating of these buildings. To me, that means therefore we should be drawing down reserves as they're coming online. Um, so we don't need to keep as much, but I, I didn't know what, what the steady state is yeah. we would be trying to look for. 
Yeah, so um, so we've thought about that a little bit, um, again, in relation to the capital stabilization fund. Um, and what amount would we want to keep in the regular stabilization fund and then everything above and beyond that would be moved to the capital. Um, so I don't think there, you know, we don't have a, a definite answer today or a recommendation. Um, think about our old policy or the, the policy of five to 15%. We've been working with the finance committee to raise that, to factor in that we've been saving for capital. Um, and so, you know, my thought was if we said 15% between free cash and general stabilization is what we want for the rainy day fund. Um, and anything above that would go into capital stabilization fund. Um, that would mean right now, based on our current reserve level, we could move over about eight or nine million into the capital stabilization fund. Um, and, and then each year, like we've been in the past, when we do free cash transfers, you know, we would keep the, the free cash and the general stabilization fund around at that 15% level. We would uh, fulfill the commitment for the reparations funding plan. And then anything above that would go into the capital stabilization fund um, and could be built up. So. Can I and just that percentage I think could be discussed, but um, yeah, yeah. So just if we said ten rather than fifteen, do we have benchmarks? With we, I know we've been building up, and that made sense to me. But um, I don't think we were at ten for most of our history. But I don't know that, and I don't know uh, name other towns. I don't even know who we would want to benchmark to. But if if we had to squeeze ourselves at the point the buildings and i'm going to question whether we can do three buildings is we've got yeah. one that we've committed to but i'm going to question that but if we if we had to pull it down could we live with 10 percent for a while as, as a question i don't need you to answer it now yeah but, no i'll just give you i think one more thing to consider um one thing that affects our bond rating specifically for the town is our reserve levels that's one thing that's uh, reflected really positively on our bond rating um and as we go forward and we take on uh, more debt, that's gonna that's gonna be a negative factor. It's gonna, I mean, we've had really our really low debt has let um, help contribute to our really positive bond rating. As we become more like other communities and take on uh, debt, um, that's no longer going to be a positive in our bond rating calculation. Um, so I, I just want to be really careful about not take not impacting other areas of our bond rating calculation and having those be uh, less positive as well. So. Um, you know, we can work again with our financial advisor and the bond rating agencies to see like what is that what is that level where if you're above it it's no longer really helping you um you know we can get more information on that yeah i um raised my hand but it's really just to to respond a little bit more to what kathy just was asking about when the policy was originally established and i was on that committee way back um when that was done we identified two major reasons for um, wanting to make sure that reserves were adequate, which went behind the five to 15% calculation that was made at the time. And I would guess that that was probably around 2007 roughly that we did that. One was um, because we recognized that reserves act as a rainy day fund, the way that rainy day funds work in the legislature that when going gets tough for economic reasons, that it enables you to draw down and you can uh, maintain essential programs and then uh, rebuild at a later date. And the other is uh, for um, cap major capital needs. And uh, that's early already been talked about. I also want to remind people that it wasn't that long afterwards that uh, we actually went into the wrong direction of, of building reserves because 2008 happened and there was a recession and uh, we were actually uh, seeing our uh, state aid going down in 2009 um, in an unpredictable manner. And uh, that rainy day fund aspect of the reserves was absolutely essential to maintain uh just the essential ongoing programs of the town uh so that's kind of the historical background um bob i see your hand is up so i can go to you next yeah sean could you just go through the assumptions around the capital allocation line the black line i guess it is and in particular i see it's going very up, up very steeply between 
FY 21 and 24, and then it sort of goes out at a normal, uh, an average rate. Now, presumably 21 is an actual, 22 is close to actual, and 23 is the budget, is that correct? Yeah, yeah so that's a good, um, that's a good cautionary tale of which we'll have more in a little bit. Um, so we, in response to the pandemic, one of the strategies that was used to preserve operating budgets was to reduce the capital budget. And so the capital budget was reduced roughly in half um, mm -hmm. in, I think it was FY21 would have been the first year. So that's why you see it starting at a really low point. We, the last few years, we've been aggressively trying to get back to 10%, which we did mm -hmm. for FY23. And then to your point, it kind of stabilizes because from that point forward, it's really just a percentage of the levy. So if the levy grows two and a half percent, then this grows two and a half percent. Okay, uh, that's, that's what I thought. I just wanted to verify that, thanks. Yep. Bernie? Yeah, um, just to, to go back in history, the five to 15% recommendation is a um, one that was made a long time ago by the Department of Revenue. and. Uh, I, I think Sean's point that we need to work with our financial advisor to find a, a spot where we're comfortable based on our spending history and what Mr. Market will, uh, how Mr. Market will view us in terms of our, our bonds is a good one. We shouldn't worry about, um, we shouldn't worry about that. We should worry about what makes sense rather than a, a, a fixed number. Uh, Department of Revenue used to have, I assume they still do, have a chart which shows you the uh, reserve funds of every town in the Commonwealth, and they're all over the place. Uh, I used to uh, tease John Musanti because Deerfield's uh, reserves were much higher on a percentage basis than Amherst's, and that's not true anymore, but that's what uh, it, it really would. You, you really have to focus on what makes sense for the town and, and what we're doing at the moment. Yeah, Sonia made sure of that, right? So she's, uh, she's taking care of that issue. All right, so I will keep going. Uh, almost done. So again, just to kind of reiterate some of the variables, uh, sorry, this got kind of knocked over, um, some of the variables and factors to consider. So uh, debt financing, so interest rates, we don't have much control over um, as a town, um, the town, we really don't have any control over. Um, the debt schedules we do, so we can structure debt in different ways, you know, really, again, it's really level principal versus level payment. Um, and uh, that's a decision we, the treasurer will make at the time we uh, borrow, but it does factor into our planning. Um, reserves, how much we want to maintain for a safety net for operating budgets versus how much we want to uh, support the capital plan with. Um, as mentioned earlier, operating versus capital. Um, there's, you know, there's going to be years where, uh, you know, things happen and we might have to reduce one or the other. And so um, we need to be able to stick to a plan, but be flexible um, in, in any particular year. Um, construction costs, and again, a variable we don't have much control over. Um, new revenues, cost reduction. So uh, we do have some revenue potential from um, selling or leasing one school site and or the central fire station. So that's something that could um, build more flexibility into this model. Um, on the flip side, there's also been talk of potentially repurposing those for other needs, which could increase costs. So, so that one's really could go either way. Um, we have reductions to operating expenses from energy savings. So if these buildings are net zero or, or you know, much more energy efficient than where they are now, um, that should help their operating budgets and what they have to spend on heating fuel and electricity and so on. And then we have reductions to operating expenses from shifting from three schools to two schools. So the superintendent um, has already you know, put together sort of a high level estimate of that for the MSBA. I'm sure that'll get more refined as we go on. Um, but again, that should, um, there should be some savings there that will alleviate some of the pressure on the operating budgets. So cautionary considerations. Um, so again, any model really doesn't matter which one it is. If, you know, if we move forward with it uh, with capital at a certain level, um, you know, we really need to stick to that level. Um, and will the community be willing to accept those strict uh, limitations um, if it means the operating budget is impacted in some way? Um, so again, if we, you know, before the pandemic hit, we had stuck, you know, we executed a plan that said we were at 10% for capital. Um, and the pandemic hit and we had to make reductions to the budget, those reductions would have had to come out of operating and, and would that have been acceptable? Um, so that's that's a big one. Uh, the fire department and the public work projects, public works projects um, still have a lot of design work as I mentioned earlier. So 
Um, you know, those cost estimates are really high level. I think before we, again, accept or uh, kind of plan around any specific model, we want to get those detailed cost estimates. Um, any model will require significant levels of new debt, which just limits some of our flexibility that we've had the past several years when, you know, we didn't have a lot of debt and we were all cash capital. Um, you know, we could, we could move things around much easier. And we, I think everyone knows this, that economic conditions are really volatile right now. Um, costs, interest rates, uh, several, many other factors, um, uh, inflation and so on. And so we just have to be, I think, more conservative now than we were maybe a year ago, given where we are and just the volatility we've seen the last year. It's, it's, I think some people thought that some of these things that have happened were impossible, like around construction costs rising at 8% a year. Um, but now we've kind of seen that it can happen. Some of the takeaways, um, very simply, construction costs and interest rates have increased. Uh, the debt exclusion amount has increased from the, the model back in 2021. Um, passage of the school debt exclusion is essential to any model. So again, we really, um, if that doesn't happen, we have to come back and look at the whole the whole plan. Um, town staff, uh, we're, so we're moving forward. We're gonna continue to utilize this model, plug in the latest uh, assumptions, work with our financial advisor um, around interest rates. You know, we'll, we'll monitor construction costs as we get more information from our, uh, from the projects that we're, that are moving along a little bit faster. Um, so we're just continuing to work on it. Um, reserves will be needed. How much is, is a decision to be made? Um, expectations around project scope and timing uh, that may need to adjust for some projects. You know, we, I think everyone sort of had visions for each project of what it what would be included, what it would look like. Um, given just the sort of economic realities, you know, we'll have to kind of revisit those. Um, and you know, Paul and mine's goal continues to continues to be to address all four buildings. Um, but again, we need to kind of stick to our values of what we said is important as we do that. I've got one more slide, Kathy. Can I, can I wait one more? Okay. I'm assuming you're saying go ahead. So Yes, right. go ahead. That's <laughs> it. I would like to come back to that slide when you finish. Okay. Um, and so next steps, uh, you know, we're going to continue our, be our best to doing our best to move forward with securing a location for the DPW. Um, that's really the sort of the key piece to getting a more detailed cost estimate is knowing where the site is going to be, what those site costs are, um, that all factors in. Uh, we want to continue building reserves to offset the annual impacts of new debt or to potentially reduce the amount of debt needed. I mean, if, if we were able to build debt up over the next three or four years, you know, we may be able to take a chunk of one of these projects and not have to borrow for it. Um, again, interest rates are not as advantageous as they were a couple of years ago. Uh, consider the creation of a capital stabilization fund to better prepare for the projects. Again, I think that's around transparency. Um, it's around getting more concrete around what portion of our reserves is for capital. Um, and when we, once we do that, I think that will help us with our develop this plan a little bit further. Uh, we want to continue work, or we're going to continue working with the school OPM and designer to estimate the debt exclusion amount and communicate those impacts to the community. We're starting to get those questions. Um, we want to make sure when we do go out with impacts that it's, you know, it's really solid and based on um, the most up-to-date information from, from our professionals, the, the OPM and the designer. Um, so I anticipate that will be soon. Um, so we're proposing to meet again in September, October is when I think, you know, we could start sharing more of that information. Um, and, uh, you know, we can update anything that's changed with any of the variables that have changed since today's meeting. And we can also talk more about those debt exclusion impacts um, the next time we, we meet. And so I think with that, Kathy. Thanks, Sean. Could you go back to the, um, that one? Okay. So one of my takeaways is that I think we re need to rethink the plan, um, that the world has shifted dramatically since we, and I only weekly said, I don't think we can afford all four when we said go for all four. I weekly said it. Now I, now I want to more strongly say it. I'm not sure we can go for all four. So I don't know what that means. Um, and DPW and FIRE are, are linked. Um, it's not like we can do fire, but not DPW or it, because of the way we talked about that. So I would like to schedule a time to say, do we need to rethink um, this? And uh, it right now, now it's been easy. Your little line is very nice because you removed $70 million because it's coming from the taxpayers. 
um, directly from the taxpayers. If we were to say, we don't want to get, have to go out for that much, but um, if we wanted to go out for 45 or 50, where are we going to get the rest of it? That's the Amherst share. So I would like to put on the table, start thinking about how much ARPA money have we not designated, you know, the second tranche that's coming in, how much of that can we use? Is there something on the current list that we don't have to spend that we could reallocate to the school, but really um, be able to be telling the taxpayers that we really scrubbed um, our resources um, before we go out for the debt exclusion. And I know there are pieces of it that could be grant supported, including, including community Preservation Act for the field improvement. And we'll get a number on how much of the school is not the school only, but this, the fact that we're getting community fields. But so if we had, you had early on a, a project budget goal, I would like to also have a debt exclusion goal of not to exceed and press ourselves hard on how we get there. So it's just based on when you go back, everyone, when you go back and look at his line, that dark line that Bob asked about, um, yeah, every time we're above it, it means we're pulling on reserves. And if we go way above it, then we have pulled down reserves, whether it's down to 5% or 10% or 15%, we're pulling it down. So there's, there's just not a lot of room there to do what I'm saying, because the MSBA just wants us to finance our part. It's not saying how we finance it. So we can have some of it is from debt exclusion. Some of it is from internal resources. So I just want to have that discussion, not necessarily tomorrow, but sooner rather than later. And it doesn't seem to me like it's a one hour discussion. It's a longer discussion. Um, so that that's so that's the rethinking the goals that were set with one one town, one plan, all four. Um, maybe we can't in this time. And then, and then what do we do? Mandy's question of the fire station is falling apart and DPW is falling apart. I, I think we need to have a plan. It's not this, we say, forget it. So I'll stop talking right now, but I keep looking at these numbers and 70 million, when we see the impact on taxpayers, it, I think it's um, a scary number. Yeah, and just the, the um, related to that. So um, one thing I'll send out after um, this meeting is if anybody wants us to model different assumptions, we'll send a little table um, that you can plug in your numbers and, and send it back to us. And we were thinking when we do meet again, um, we can review if, if anybody has different assumptions they want to see modeled, we can model them and, and review them at that time uh, with the finance committee. So um, we'll send out, you know, it's a pretty simple table. You can plug in you know, what cost you want. If, you know, if you don't want a project on there, you can, you can indicate that and we can, um, you know, update the model to show what it looks like. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to um, refresh my memory on what the debt exclusion looks like to the taxpayers. So um, we borrow some money, let's say the taxpayers approve a debt exclusion we borrow some money and um, property taxes go up a certain percent or a certain amount for 30 years or for some period of time. Um, does the increase, so does the increase in property taxes at the first year, does that become a baseline for against which we do the two and a half percent increase or does the two and a half percent increase remain at the baseline prior to the debt exclusion? Yeah, so um, Paul or so, I don't know if Sony isn't here, correct me if I'm wrong, but with the debt exclusion, it's it's separate. Um, if it was an override, I believe that becomes part of the new base. Um, but this is, since this is specifically for debt and it goes away eventually, um, I don't believe it gets calculated into the base that the two and a half percent is applied to, but um, we can, I can get the, a definite answer unless Paul or Sonia have that off the top of their head. Of course, it depends on which two and a half percent you're talking about. You're talking about the increase or the, per, the, the absolute cap. 
which you can't change. the the allowable annual increase in tax or the levy increase yeah. of the um, the term debt exclusion comes from the fact that you are excluding debt from your regular budget that is governed by the two and a half percent right that doesn't get calculated of the voters and that's where the term comes from I, I i agree with that i think that it is excluded and we can get clarity on that unless sonia knows sonia is here um but it does it is excluded from the calculations from prop two and a half to, by the way they've set it up okay. right it doesn't get added to your base yeah i think i think it would be important to communicate that when the time comes because I think people would be concerned about, oh, we're going to compound this every year, you know. No, and again, so the yeah, and the amount, um, the amount of debt that gets excluded is whatever that year's debt payment is, unless we have some other source of, of funding to reduce it. It's whatever that amount is, and so that's why again, how we structure the debt is important because if we do the level principal um, option where it means that that impact of the debt exclusion is going to be greater in the early years and then get smaller in the future. If we do the level payment option, that impact will stay roughly the same each year. Um, and so again, that, that sort of builds into the, the, the planning process of what uh, taxpayers um, would prefer or what they can tolerate. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Are there additional questions now from the committee? or from the council, because if I, I said that at an appropriate time, I would ask um, to see if there's any public comment, uh, since that's traditional part of all council and committee meetings. And uh, so I wanna go there unless there are questions that the council or uh, committee wanna ask right now. So turning then um, for members of the public who are present, if you um, wish to make public comment, uh, we will accept, uh, certainly welcome public comment for um, three or so minutes uh, at maximum on what you've heard and your thoughts about this. If um, so, I'll just pause for a moment to see if anybody who's an attendee wishes to um, comment then they should raise their hand. Seeing no request for public comment, um, I will turn it back to the uh, council and the committee to see if there's any other questions or comments um, about the presentation or sort of the underlying assumptions. Lynn. Um, Kathy raised a question, and if we have an answer for it, I would like to at least understand the parameters. And that is the question of, are there any ARPA monies uh, either left or that could be recaptured that could go toward the school? And if there are, what is our estimate of those? and is that allowable? And what um, what would really what would we really have to do in terms of finding using those monies or others to make a significant impact on what we went out to the public for? Now, I have a follow-on question, but let me pause with that. So. Um... Right now for ARPA, there's, I think a little over 2 million that was not in round one. Um, I can't speak to, you know, we're still sort of at the beginning of ARPA. So it's hard to say projects that have already been allocated funds, you know, what aren't you gonna spend? Um, but we will be checking in each year with the with whoever's in charge of those projects to find out how they're doing. Um, but in terms of funds that are just, that we haven't earmarked for anything, it's um, about 2 million. Um, it's not really, within the, you know, the intent of ARPA, I wouldn't say, when you look at the, the sort of core uses of ARPA, what it was designed for in terms of um, helping people recover from the pandemic, but also kind of rebuilding out of the pandemic um, and, and kind of rebuilding your economy. Um, that being said, we have talked uh, with our legal counsel a little bit about it, you know, if it would be eligible. Um, it's not 100% clear, there, you know, there, there would be a lot of, um, 
there's gonna be a lot of reporting requirements that we would have to uh, look into further to find out if we could use this for a, a capital project. Um, there may be other ways to achieve that outcome where the funds aren't used directly for the for the uh, the school project. Um, but I think we would need to know again if that's the direction we want to move. And I think we we have we have had preliminary thoughts how to use the remaining ARPA funds that we feel like are good uses for those funds and um, that we want to discuss as well. Um, so we can get more information on that, but we have had some initial conversations and it was basically the answer was you have to be really careful um, if we decide to go that route. I'm going to pause and since we're kind of on this topic and come back to my other topic afterward. Um, I just wanted to say, Sean, at least one person, but I don't know whether um, you'd have to do research. The suggestion was that we would might be able to use it for the designer fees or the OPM fees for that. So not the mm. building um, that that was potentially an allow when you said capital versus I don't know how those are things. And the the statement was they thought at least a town was doing it, but I don't know. You know, I don't. That's hearsay rather than yeah. I know for sure. No, I think you're right. I think not every town is. Um, there's a there's a big. Uh, swath of how um, towns are spending their ARPA funds. Um, so that's why I don't want to say it's uh, not possible, but um, again, we've sort of taken the approach of getting community input and where were people most impacted and, and focusing our funds that way. Um, and so again, we'll, we'll, we'll get more of a, a, a official response on whether it's even possible um, and if there's you know easier ways to do it than others. Bernie? Yeah, um, I would just want to reinforce the idea of using ARPA funds, as I've said before, if, if there's some capital project, immediate capital project, or or purchasing that we can do with them to then save money later, we should try to do it. I understand the danger with ARPA is the rules are vague and everything's going to be checked on a post audit basis. So uh, we may spend the money and find out five years from now we shouldn't have done it. But uh, those are the, the, the risks we take. And I just encourage the use of ARPA funds um, uh, <clears throat> for, uh, to, to relieve us of as much uh, current spending as we, uh, as we can. Uh, the other thing is, is I think we need to issue a caution to uh, folks that they need to tap the brakes in terms of what they think needs to happen in terms of other programs and other uh, facility uses in town. I, I mean, we're hearing about how we need senior center. Uh, we need this center. We need that center. We can reuse the school for this. We can reuse the school for that. We can turn the central fire station into a performing arts space. All those are wonderful ideas, but they may just have to be set aside in the face of, of the economic reality. The third thing is, is that really um, Amherst hasn't demonstrated that it can do things rapidly in time. Time is money. So I would favor if we're going to we're going to look at models. I'd favor a model that compresses things, and that we push very hard, very fast, to get some good designs on the the uh, uh, the, the remaining two buildings and good costs, so that we can act uh, sooner rather than later. Because um, time's money, to use that old cliche. Uh, you, you know, we'll we've. Um, we're paying the price of not acting five years ago. We're paying the price of, uh, of just kind of taking our time uh, for whatever reason with the design on the other facilities. Thanks. Okay. Anything else in the committee? Did you, Lynn, you had something else that you wanted to raise? Yeah, I wanna, I wanna go back to the fire and DPW and, um, Paul, you recently in a comment uh, talked about the condition of the DPW uh, building, and I'd like you to share that with the entire group. Uh, and I, and then I would also just go on and say, I think we are too rapidly willing to say these are not necessary buildings for our community, and the the. That is not correct. They are necessary buildings for our community. They are very much part of our public safety. Both 
have been on the books for a while, particularly the fire station. By the time I chaired that group, it was the third study. So delay, delaying those any further may mean that we're actually looking at enormous costs to try to stay in buildings that are so antiquated that we're just throwing good money after bad. So, Paul? So, yeah. So, I mean, all of our, many of our buildings are in bad shape. We know that. That's why we've been building up the um, facility money in our capital plan to address many of our buildings. Um, the town has always, in my view, prioritized the two school buildings as being as needing replacement. I mean, it's unfortunate we didn't do that when the opportunity when we had the opportunity. Um, that's a multi-million dollar issue for us. Um, we had a delay with the library because of a lawsuit that cost us a year, basically. Um, so I think that um, the condition of the fire station and the DPW, especially the DPW. Um, is becoming dire. The, you know, we looked, you know, one of our exercises is to say, suppose we can't move forward. Suppose we have to restore the buildings that we have. For instance, for the DPW, it needs a new roof. There's a question, and we have not done the engineering on this, whether the building could, the structural integrity of the building could support a new roof. If we just said, let's stay where we are, right? That's one of our things. Um, are we rebuilding what's there? And then there's also all kinds of water concerns um, in the DPW right now um, that we can't fix without a new roof. So things are getting dire. Um, we are doing what we can with the funds that we have. Um, we, I think Sean tried to address many of these things in his presentation. We need to um, re-gauge our appetite to say, you know, we're not doing the ideal, we're doing basically what I call like for like. What we have as a fire station is what we're gonna get as a fire station. We're not gonna have a lot of new bells and whistles. We'll do what's mandatory and what's needed to make sure our employees are working in a safe uh, environment. And the same with our DPW. Um, there's a lot of desires that we have that would be an ideal situation, but, and I think we have to bring that same kind of, um, um, approach to the library and to the schools as well. There's a lot of things that are that we'd like to have that we're just not going to be able to afford. Um, but I think the situation in our two um, public safety buildings, the DPW and the fire is, is getting bad. Um, and so these are things that can't wait as well. They're just complex. So I have one additional concern, and I expressed it before um, in a different context, and I'll just say it again, but very simply, and that is that the operating budget assumptions for future years do need a review, and I think that there's an intent to do that, but um, to remember that we have been assuming each year essentially two and a half to three percent increase in operating budgets and have been building budgets based upon that thinking that that can continue services um, but uh, with inflation i think it's a questionable issue kathy mentioned that um, concerns about health insurance um, there are other costs that we incur on a regular basis that are going up at a greater rate than that allowable um, amount. And uh, the um, um, other factors that get thrown in there is that um, we funded new departments and um, certainly Crest and DEI were built into the FY23 budget. So if you assume a percentage increase on existing budgets and anything that was built into the budget, you've got covered, but we have four firefighter positions that were funded through ARPA and uh, the ARPA runs out in two years. So um, I really think we need to be thinking very carefully um, about what the operating budgets are going forward. 
how that interplays with what we're talking about today with capital budgets and um, just to make council and the community uh, cognizant of the fact that our uh, resources are limited, not unlimited, which is, I think, the way some people have begun to view them. And so. can I just add to that quickly too? Um, and we'll, we'll talk about this more when we do the financial indicators report, but I think all of that also speaks to the need for economic growth in town. Um, the town's been pretty good at that the last few years. Um, I see Dave Zomack and Paul, you guys have done, done a great job at spurring that economic development, um, but we're gonna continue to need it uh, <laughs> to, to uh, keep pace with, uh, well, just to, to help fund the vision that a lot of people have for the community in the future. Um, that new growth on top of our existing tax base is essential. Um, so just we'll, we'll reemphasize that in the fall when we do the financial indicators report, but it really is um, critical to accomplish the goals that we've set. Bob, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just had a couple of things, thoughts, random thoughts to throw out. Um, one is that we've, you know, the models are assuming a 30 year uh, borrowing period can we borrow for 40 years or 45 years? Um, would that obviously re would reduce the annual hit uh, to the town? And the second thought I had is, you know, we've we've assumed a debt exclusion for the school building, but maybe we need to assume, or maybe we need to look at a debt exclusion and also to cover one of the other buildings, because it may be that with the pressures on the operating budget. We just can't get there uh, without having a debt exclusion for some of the other one or two of the other buildings. And I'm not suggesting we, we want to do that. I'm just saying that we might want to take a look at that and see what the impacts are. Yeah, no, um, can I respond to that, Andy? Is that a, sure. You know, we did set up, again, if, if you want, I'll send out the, you know, a structure for people to submit different ideas. Um, the model set up so we can, you know, debt exclude different a different number of buildings. We were, I think, considering two buildings under the prior assumptions before costs really mm -hmm. um, accelerated, mm -hmm. um, but it's still something that could be considered. Um, and then 30, you know, to my knowledge, 30 years is sort of the, the maximum. I, there may be ways with, with legislation or with certain approvals to go beyond that, but, um, you know, we also, one of our other financial policies that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be testing, um, if not, going past is that we try to maintain, uh, have a certain percentage of our debt paid off within 10 years. Um, and that speaks to just not, not having too much debt on the books, especially long-term debt. And so, you know, the, the farther out we stretch the debt, the, again, it just kind of kicks some things down the road a little bit. So I get, I totally understand trying to figure out different variables, ways we can make it all work. Um, you know, if anything, I've actually explored you know, can we go quicker, pay it off, you know, in 10 years, get a lower interest rate because the short of the borrowing, um, you know, you can get usually get more competitive rates. Um, and, and again, depending on how you space out the projects, maybe there's an opportunity there to, to do shorter borrowings and really hit the principal as fast as you can. So um, yeah, there's more, more to explore there. Hey, Linda, you had your... Yeah, I... I just want to thank Sean and Sonia and Paul for this chilling presentation. Um, it's a reality that uh, it was high time for us to see. And for those of us from the previous council to revisit and for the new counselors. And while several of the newer new counselors were not able to be with us today, it has been recorded. And when we come back to look at it again in say September, October, when we start getting more firm numbers for the schools, uh, it, hopefully it'll be something that all of us can look at. It's the, the thing that I think is most important here is that it gives us the other part of the budget picture that has been alluded to but not shown in the way that we have seen it today. Um, we've been now through one budget uh, setting period um, with the new council and all 13 of us. 
uh, but it didn't include, um, it, it included some capital, but it didn't include this part of the picture. And so it's very critical that the time that was spent on this uh, by Sean and um, Sonia and Paul is um, just critical that you've laid it out. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, just to um, frame it. So the timing of this is we will come back in September, October with the latest, we will have more clarity on the school project in particular, um, and then on all the projects actually. Um, the council will have the fall to sort of grapple with this because in December is when the council will need to decide if it's going to go for a debt exclusion override. Um, when you make, when the council makes that decision, it's gonna need all the information, all the financial information possible. And assuming that you know the timing right now is for a debt exclusion override to happen in March of 2023, the council will need to make that decision come December. You're going to need the fall to sort of examine and sort of pour, you know, go through all these numbers and really understand them. So when you come to December to make your decision, because the people are going to need to know that by the first of the year in order to make their sort of campaign and their decisions by March of that's how we're sort of laying this out. Um, so the next meeting, when we are able to update this with little, with firmer numbers um, across the board, I think will be a really important meeting for the entire council and finance committee. Thank you. Matt? Thank you, Andy. And yeah, I just want to echo that. I really appreciate um, Sean and Paul, clarity and, and all the work that went into this. Um, I, this is a question, it's probably, this question may not be helpful, but I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around the scenarios, and I realize that these are just sort of places for us to start the conversation, but um, you know, changing the, the start date on, on borrowing for the fire station, uh, and then in, in from scenario one to scenario two, that, so that's kind of a huge variable change there, but then also changing the use of you know, 13.4 in reserves all the way down to in, in scenario one, and then all the way down to 5.7 in scenario two. Can you? You may have explained this, and I just I just didn't quite follow you. But um, why is the why is scenario two using such a, a low amount of the reserves? Yeah, so no, that's a good question. So the 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 reserve number again is really the plug. So it's the the number that gets spit out after you plug in all the other assumptions. Um, the you know the spreadsheet just calculates how far you're above. Um, and so the two you know a couple of the big reasons why scenario two uses such such uh, lower reserve amounts. Um, one, it increases the capital uh, allocation to ten and a half percent, so it's it's set aside more for capital, um, so that raises the the, the funding level. Um, it reduces how much is allocated towards other capital needs in town down to three million from three and a half in the prior scenario. That is a that has a really large impact. You know, if you think about five hundred thousand per year, you know, every year that you were over, that's five hundred thousand dollars less now. Um, and then the interest rate assumption is lower in scenario two. It's it's using four percent instead of um, five percent for some of the projects in the out years. So um, those are the biggest factors why it's such a, you know it looks better. Um, it's really a function of changing the the ten percent. Yeah, it's a, it's a the, the reserve amount is a function of all the other assumptions that you make. It, it's basically what do you need then to make this work? Um, okay. But I mean, you know, just to follow that up just a little bit further, I mean, it would be interesting, right, to, to look at scenario two with a more realistic timeline for the four projects with a higher reserve amount and see what the implications were. Yeah, I mean, scenario two, I mean, scenario two's timeline is not all that um, different from, you know, what we've been thinking for a timeline. I mean, the fire station may be out a year or two farther than what we thought before, but um, scenario two was sort of the timeline we were, um, you know, we were trying to do the project as quickly as possible. Are you talking about pushing one out farther into the farther away or moving it closer? No, uh, no. I think I think scenario two is a timeline that's be more palatable to people. Okay, I mean, gotcha. It's still a little further out than we'd like, but yep. it's a lot better than you know twenty thirty two. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. I agree. Okay. Anything else for questions for today? So I think that. Uh, We've been given a lot to think about. And so thank you. I want to also join in Sean, Paul, and Sonia thanking you for the amount of work that went into making this presentation for the committee. Um, 
I am not seeing right now that there's going to be um, a need to necessarily uh, convene the committee for a meeting before September. Um, we certainly have been meeting a lot um, through the budget season and since the budget season. Um, we will have a number of things that are coming up that are hard to predict in time. Um, the minutes I do want to get cleaned up and get them finalized and posted. So I'm going to have to work with the committee to see if we um, end up needing a very brief special meeting for that purpose. But um, have to get the minutes together in a fashion that they can be easily um, consumed and disposed of. Um, so I don't know what else to say, um, Athena. Thank you, Andy. I just wanted to suggest that because we have such a large amount of minutes and they're not ready today and the next meeting may not be until September, the, the committee could designate one member to approve the minutes on its behalf so that we can get these get these done in, in the interim and then going forward it would be the usual process. So just for the ones that are on the agenda today, we could do something like that. Okay. Uh, does, uh, this has been done by other committees uh, and boards. It is permissible. Uh, committee can designate one person to approve minutes. Uh, Lynn, I see your hand up and then Kathy. Lynn? Yeah, I was, unless somebody really is a glutton for punishment, um, I would also suggest splitting them up among us and, you know, see if there's, you know, three or four or five of us that are willing to take a couple different ones and set a deadline by which we do it. That wasn't the reason I had my hand up, though. Um, okay, I, I'll wanted, come back to I you wanted to bring up another discussion. Okay, I'll, I'll, hold, I'll come back to you in just a second. Keep your hand up. Uh, Kathy, were you going to comment on yeah, I was going to talk about minutes. Um, for the first three years, we did designate a person, and it was me. And Andy decided to remove, to relieve me of doing the minutes. Um, and then we didn't do them at all. But I like your idea, Lynn, of each of us taking three meetings worth, two meetings worth, and just... Um, and, and when I say when I was doing it, the minutes we've been getting are quite excellent. And I kind of would check them against my notes and quickly look at the Zoom thing if I thought something didn't, didn't seem right or we'd have a longer discussion on it. So I usually had my, what I would say quite minor edits to get to final. Um, so I, I'm willing to take a few. I am not volunteering to get to go back to what I just saw in the list. I am not. <laughs> it it was it was indeed time consuming, but um but we I think we haven't done it since I stopped checking them. So right. That's a difficult uh topic for me to talk about. I, th I think that the minutes are are varied. Some are excellent and can be disposed of really quickly. Some are not best I, because I have looked at some of the minutes. Sean? I uh, just wanted to follow up. I promised Mandy Jo that I would tell her the reserve level before we ended. Um, <laughs> and so to, to start FY22, uh, we were at 25%, as I said, and our reserve that, that in terms of dollars is about 21.3 million. Okay. So back to minutes for a second. Um, why don't I just uh, uh, send an email out to the committee since this is, uh, I think something, unless Athena thinks otherwise, that uh, at this point we could do um, for at least dividing the minutes up. Uh, I don't think that it requires that it be done during an open meeting. Um, Lynn, you had another topic. Yeah, uh, people are aware uh, because we've sent forwarded an email that the regional schools are putting together a guardrail committee to look at um, 
the way that they, if you will, balanced the last year's budget, particularly as it relates to the assessment for each town and yet provided some level of um, security, if you will, for not going above a certain percentage. In this case, it was 4%. They are forming the committee that was discussed during those email out. I have gotten uh, responses from both Paul and Sean about interest and also from four counselors. And we will be bringing that to the town council on the 15th of August. And I should say also one of the uh, non-voting member residents of the, of the um, uh, finance committee has also expressed interest. Um, the um, I, I do have concern in that some people think of this as um, being mostly important for the elementary, I mean, for the other re small towns. And, and the reality is it's not. It's incredibly important for us as well. And so uh, it's something that we will be also returning to. The thing that made it less urgent than it first was is that two of the towns have not even responded to the superintendent's request because many of the smaller towns don't meet during the summer. And so it now looks as if those meetings at the earliest would take place very end of August, beginning of September. And so that's why we haven't moved forward on that. But since that's a directly related to the finance committee, uh, I thought it was useful to at least bring it up at this meeting. Okay. Yeah. Are there any questions that people have or comments on what Lynn has just reported? I'm seeing none. Um, so I don't think that there's any purpose for going forward. I will um, work with Athena and uh, see if we can uh, come up with a plan and then notify all members of the finance committee would, um, so that people have an opportunity to volunteer to take some minutes and review them. And the more we can divide them up, then the less any one individual needs to do. Um, and uh, I will, so I will follow up on that. Um, I'll keep you informed if there's a need for a meeting earlier than September, but at this point, I'm not going to try and schedule one because I'm trying to avoid that. So um, is there anything else that anybody from the committee or for that matter from the council would like to raise before we adjourn? Because otherwise I'm going to turn it over to Lynn to adjourn the council and then I will adjourn the finance committee. Um, given that we are at the end of the meeting, I'm adjourning the town council meeting at 8.40. Thank you. 4.40. 4.40. 40. Thank you. And I'm adjourning the, uh, the finance committee at the same time. And thank you again, Sean, Paul, and Sonia. Thank you.